Hello, boils and ghouls. I gotta write that time. Alright, guys, welcome to episode 3 on the Mothman of Point Pleasant. Trying to figure out what exactly this creature was, is, could have been, what these people in Point Pleasant and the surrounding areas could have been seeing down there. First, I just want to say thanks so much, guys, for the real positive uh, feedback and stuff on, on the last two videos on doing this. Because, uh, like I said, this is something I've wanted to do and talk about for a while. So, um, I've been getting a lot of good feedback and uh, the views have been good on this. So, um, I'm glad that it's at least interesting uh, to some people. And we'll probably be doing this for uh, other cryptids and mysteries, legends, etc. down the road. But let's recap a little on our mission here to f try to figure out what the mothman was or is i say was and is because i talk back in the late 60s the 66 to 67 year of all the initial sightings before the collapse of the silver bridge and then just to the, to this day there's still sightings so what it was back then is it this the same thing the same exact creature that people are seeing today and in the last few decades that was there for the bridge collapse or was that just like we've talked about in the past a bad omen a good omen whichever one and his job there was done and that's why sightings about him went down right after the bridge collapse in addition to a more plausible reason is that this was not a delusion and we've gone over this that that's one thing we can rule out at least i'm ruling out is that this is something that people are just thinking they're seeing but they're not seeing anything they definitely were seeing something so i take that right out that it's a hoax like this isn't a hoax this has been seen by so many people and documented by so many people, reported. So the fact it's not a hoax. Misidentification we've talked about with the Sandhill crane and similar cranes and herons and birds that shouldn't be in the West Virginia area. They're not native there. But somehow, you know, got during migration they ended up stopping in Point Pleasant in 66 67 at least one of them we've talked about how i feel about that whole theory the, the crane here looks nothing like this here that is the description that we've heard over and over again from the mothman so i can throw that out too now we talked about the mutation theory that possibly because of the tnt area being so heavily just contaminated from TNT chemicals that were being used in World War II in the munitions plant there, that they even had people come, like government agencies come, to try to clean up the area. Like it's, it's no secret that there is a bunch of chemicals in the TNT area, and that they'll likely, there always will be. Like you, you don't get that type of chemicals out of the ground permanently forever. So was it a mutated crane? Was it a mutated bird of some kind? This is one I still have to s keep on the shelf. I have to stick that one on the bookshelf of possibilities for where I'll try to, at the end of this series, come to my conclusion on what I think this really is or was. So the mutation theory, again, I'm going to have to keep because there is credibility to that. It does make sense scientifically. It does make sense logically. And you know how they say Occam's razor. You know, usually the most simplest explanation is what the explanation is. Of course, that's not how it always is. And when we're talking about stuff that's possibly paranormal or alien, extraterrestrial, then those rules go out the window as well. So... The theory on the chemicals affecting eyewitnesses and possibly causing hallucinogenic effects, and they were actually seeing something, maybe it was a crane, maybe it was just some other bird, and that was making them 
actually see something much scarier, more frightening, and could explain the trance-like feeling of staring into its eyes. I touched on that. I think it's a very interesting theory. I think it, it definitely could be responsible for some of the sightings, but not all of them. As we said, even the first real sighting with uh, the scarberries and the mallets, they were driving the entire time. Like, they were driving on the main road, passing the TNT area, back into Point Pleasant. So there was no chemicals affecting them, and this is when the Mothman was chasing them all the way back to town at 100 miles per hour at one point, and then disappeared. So I'll take that theory, and I'll add it to the mutation theory, and just keep it as a side note, but I in no way think that accounts for everything. It, there's no way it can. And then we have the group delusion theory, which I didn't touch on much because I don't think this is what it is. But we have that this small town that could have been, and they were shaken up at these sightings and stuff. These people were afraid. They didn't know what this creature was that they were seeing. And that's, again, lends credibility to both the character of these eyewitnesses. These are kind, hardworking people in a small town. They don't, they've had their names established there forever, for generations, some of them. They don't, they're not the type that just want to report stuff like this and sound like a lunatic. Like, they saw something and it frightened them. And it was starting to scare the entire town of Point Pleasant during 66 up until the bridge collapse to the point that they, a lot of people had a feeling that it was leading up to something, that something bad was going to happen, that it, it just, that you could feel it in the air, like the aura, everything. It just, there was just a feeling that it was all of this craziness with the, seeing the UFOs and the, and the strange lights and orbs in the sky, the, all the Mothman sightings, the men in black, all of this was leading to something big. And some think that the bridge collapse was that thing it was leading up to, which is why I try to separate the pre-bridge collapse Mothman sightings with everything afterwards, because possibly could be a different creature or a different misidentification or a whole different separate entity to what the Mothman was leading up to the bridge collapse. If that was just him being an omen, then he left. Then maybe what people have been seeing there ever since is another cryptid that looks like a big flying creature, which there are a ton of those. We touched a little bit on the Thunderbirds in the last episode, where the Native American beliefs in the Thunderbirds, the giant birds that would fly over the sky that could be linked to the Mothman. There's a whole bunch of other ones in modern times, like in the last few centuries, that are in all different other uh, states in the United States, in Canada, basically on every continent on the planet. <laughs> Just like there's a Bigfoot everywhere. Same thing here with a flying cryptid. So that might be an episode to come. It's just related cases and cryptids to the Mothman. And maybe this is all part of one big thing, that this is all being looked at as small pieces of a giant puzzle. And maybe the Mothman is one entity, maybe it's a species. Now that's getting into the theories on the paranormal side. Could this be just a creature, like a, exactly what a cryptid is, that we haven't discovered yet? On that side of it, I'm going to take that off the shelf. Because it's kind of what takes away any of my belief nowadays in Bigfoot and the Loch, Loch Ness Monsters. Somebody would have seen this thing. Someone would have gotten a picture of it. Someone would have got a video of it. We would have found remains. We would have anything like that, especially being contained for the most part around and in Point Pleasant and especially the TNT area. 
There were feathers found in one of the igloos in the TNT area. I mentioned that in the last episode. This was in the mid-80s, though. Still, they're feathers. Anyone never take them to get tested at a university, see what type of feather? No, so, like, there's no information there. But the fact or the theory of it being a cryptid in the sense that we all know when we think of cryptids as an undiscovered species, an animal or something, I don't think that's the case at all, and I'm taking that off as, an, as a possibility and an explanation. The next, this is when it really goes, you know, the paranormal alien route, is that it is extraterrestrial in origin. That it is somehow also linked to the UFO sightings in the area leading up to the bridge collapse during all the Mothman sightings as well. And to this day, like I said, it's a hot spot over there in uh, West Virginia. It's particularly around Point Pleasant for UFOs and lights in the sky and orbs. So is this all related? And the Mothman is some type of, you know, alien entity. We touched on a lot on Injured Cold in the last episode. The supposed extraterrestrial that visited Woodrow Derenberger when he was driving home and saw a craft land and injured cold came out introduced himself talked telepathically so there was a theory i mentioned in there that that could be another manifestation of the mothman injured cold and mothman could be the same thing i don't really buy that theory but it's it's you can't deny it like there's no proof against it so i'll let it stand for now but all of this coming into consideration and the fact that the men in black make an appearance here i think is another big point in the direction that this is something extraterrestrial or paranormal and that the government knows about this and maybe not particularly the malt man and like what this is exactly but Just like all other cases, the government has denied and everything, and that we've heard men in black uh, stories about, which that's what we're going to focus on for the rest of the episode here, is the men in black and Mary Heyer and her visit from them and other cases involving the men in black. I'm not talking Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones. (laughs) We all know that's a great movie. The sequels aren't that good, though, but this has nothing to do with the Mothman. We're going to dive into the men in black. But the fact that they were involved too, plus the UFOs and the lights in the sky and the Mothman sightings, and there were other just weird things happening in town, and like chickens disappearing overnight, and like a lot of strange stuff. And that's why people thought it was leading up to something like a disaster, and it did with the bridge collapse. So the fact that the men in black showed up, that really points to me that this, if not explainable in a logical, scientific way, this is assuming that Mothman is real and that it is either extraterrestrial in origin, paranormal, or or it's from another dimension. So, what are the men in black? For those of you who... I'm assuming most are into this type of stuff. Otherwise, why are you listening? But for people who just discover this or this mystery and, and legend in particular, and for some reason never heard of Men in Black, it's just like the movie. <laughs> it was based actually on these stories and you know alleged accounts and meetings and encounters with these supposed Men in Black that they work for some type of government agency they never it's never revealed what they work for but it's they usually travel in pairs i know that sounded like like dogs or some shit but whatever they travel in pairs is where you hear in a lot of sightings and encounters with them usually with all dressed in black black suits black sunglasses black hats black ties 
and they end up going and visiting people who have either had UFO slash alien encounters or sightings, and they will tell them to stop talking about what you saw. Stop talking about what you think you saw. You didn't see anything. And they would pretty much come up, they would threaten them without directly threatening them. Some people have even, there's been some cases that they were directly threatened. But this goes back to the, like the 40s, the mid to late 40s. In 1947, there was a man who claimed that a men in black guy in a dark suit warned him to not discuss his UFO sighting on Maury Island. We have it in the 50s as well. We have, through every decade, there's been reports of this being tied in with alien sightings, UFO sightings, alien abduction, all of that. John Keel, who is somebody we have not talked much about yet, and we will have a whole episode on, is the ufologist who came to Point Pleasant to try to figure out what was going on with the Mothman in the late 60s. And he ended up writing his findings and what he you know, experienced there and learned from everybody else, heard from people, wrote The Mothman Prophecies, the novel, which was then adapted into the movie with Richard Gere and Laura Linney, which is a great film. But Keel claimed to have encounters more than one time with the men in black and referred to them as demonic supernaturals with dark skin and or exotic facial features. This is another thing that we hear about the men in black in a lot of the reports and sightings on them is that they act very unnatural almost as if they're not from this planet. Like, I've heard cases of, like, one of them looking at a, at a pen in an odd way, like he didn't know how a pen worked, or looking at a phone in the same way, like showing a little bit of curiosity towards something, but it not being natural because they don't know what it is. Which leads to a whole theory there that these aren't government agents, that they're actually extraterrestrials themselves. Or in, in some way that they're extraterrestrials, paranormal, alternate dimension, we're just going to loop that all together onto the supernatural extraterrestrial banner. That they could be some other species of extraterrestrial that's trying to make sure that us humans don't spread the word and find out about others, other species of aliens out there. So you can get way out there with the men in black, but there's some significant cases that are very interesting. Keels being uh, one of them, but we'll talk about Keels in his own episode. The first interesting case of the men in black is actually the very first recorded one that I can find. And it's the one I mentioned in 1947 from Harold Dahl. So he was interviewed, and this was his response on his sighting. On June 21st, 1947, in the afternoon, about 2 o'clock, I was patrolling the East Bay of Maury Island. I, as captain, was steering my patrol boat close to the shore of a bay on Maury Island. On board were two crewmen, my 15-year-old son and his dog. As I looked up from the wheel on my boat, I noticed six very large donut-shaped aircraft in the sky. He then went on to say that one of the crafts that he saw in the air started to litter this type of, it looked like newspaper to him, debris from what seemed like underneath the ship which turned out being some type of light metal fragment, he says. And it ended up crashing onto the boat, killing his dog, and his son had his arm broken from this falling debris. He was then visited by a man in black, a singular one, and told him to not tell anyone what you saw, of not what happened, and he got his first visit here. This is the first time we heard of the man in black. Now... 
the FBI did investigate this case and concluded that was it was a hoax. Just putting that out there. Even though this is the fucking FBI. We don't believe a word they say. Now, a very interesting one, and for probably this reason alone, we have a photograph of one of the men in black in this case. It's from 1968, New Jersey, Jack Robinson. Him and his wife were living in their apartment. He was a UFO researcher, which men in black have been known to visit UFO researchers or people who have seen UFOs and are talking about their sightings, the whole gamut. So he and his wife were seeing this man in black across the street from their apartment that would just stand there like at all different times of the day for days on end and when they would leave and come back they would notice that their stuff was rummaged through all their their paperwork possessions their drawers everything was gone through their friend timothy was able to get this picture which is one of the few pictures of a supposed man in black so just for this alone it's interesting of course it could just be a guy in a suit <laughs> i mean it's not even a suit it's just a guy you know just chilling there and have nothing to do with anything but interesting nonetheless now just on what i said just there on it could just be some guy this is what Keel argues in his book, The Mothman Prophecies, that some of these encounters with the men in black could be explained as entirely just mundane events that just are kept going through uh, and told over and over again through folklore. So even though he has his own sightings of them and interactions, which, again, we'll talk about. One last one that I just think is hysterical just because because I never heard of this, but in 2002, in January, in New York, actor Dan Aykroyd had a encounter with the supposed Men in Black. He was putting, he sold a show called Out There that was supposed to like blow the lid off. A whole bunch of topics like UFOs and alien abductions, crop circle, and um, all, all of that. And he ended up going outside and he saw a black car and a man in black just appear across the street. The man in black looked at him, gave him kind of like a, we're disappointed in you or you shouldn't be doing this type of grin, and look... And he just disappeared along with the vehicle. Like a few seconds later. Now this is coming from Dan Aykroyd. He went back inside and was told by, I guess, the producers that he was selling the show to. That bad news, we can't go along with the show. We have to cancel it and we're not showing any of them. So that's a little odd. <laughs> I mean, it's Dan Aykroyd. I don't know how much of a partier he was his whole life, <laughs> but take that for what it is. Dan Aykroyd has actually seen a man in black. Now, I've shown a picture a few times in the last two videos of the men in black. This is from an actual case, and there's video footage which makes this probably the most important one now this took place in 2008 so not too long ago in the grand scope of everything especially in the Mothman story October 14 2008 in Niagara Falls this happened to somebody somebody named Shane Sovar so Shane Sovar who was a hotel manager along with one of the staff members saw a big triangular ufo in the sky near niagara falls now after the sighting a few weeks later 
the same hotel that he that Shane managed. He wasn't working that day, neither was the other co-worker who saw the UFO. But two men in black supposedly came in and spoke to one of the staff. And she described them as the usual dress, not dress, but you know what I mean, how they dress. The usual black suit, black hats, but they had no eyelashes and they had no eyebrows, which has been reported in other sightings and encounters with men in black. Not a lot that I've heard, but I have heard other instances of this and that they had very big eyes and that they were acting very unnaturally, like I was mentioning earlier. And when Shane came back to work and heard this, he went over the security footage and this was the footage that he saw. Now, again, could it just be two people in suits and this woman is just making it up? Could it have been a hoax? Absolutely. Same with all of these. So the men, the whole men in black thing as a whole, I'll keep it on the shelf on the paranormal side, but it's something that is so easily disproven and so easily can be not what it is taken as in the UFO community and in these types of stories and legends that it could just be actual U.S. government officials and there is some type of cover-up. They could be paranormal, they can be extraterrestrial, other dimensional, or they can just be regular people in suits. <laughs> so it can go either way with them. Now, Mary Heyer, the journalist who was taking in all of these reports and encounter sightings and stuff from all these eyewitnesses was also visited by the men in black. There was another woman named Connie Carpenter who had an experience in the sighting of the Mothman who was then almost dragged and kidnapped, almost dragged into an old black sedan by a man in black and for several weeks afterwards stuff in our house would be repositioned they would show up in in weird places like her house was being broken into and when Mary Heyer was visited by these men in black they asked her and this was December of 67 and they asked her quote what would she do if somebody ordered her to stop writing about flying saucers? Then, later the same day, another one came by, asked the same question. What would you do if someone told you to stop writing about UFOs or flying saucers? And he claimed that he was a UFO researcher. The next day, Linda Scarberry, the one of the people involved in the very first sighting of the Mothman that were chased back to town ended up getting visited by a man in black who asked the same question, which, I mean, she wasn't writing about it, I guess, but she told her story. And, of course, how could we forget our friend Devin Berger, who was the one who was visited by Indrid Cold, the extraterrestrial grinning man on his way home. He was visited several times by the men in black. People in his town were visited and questioned about him and his supposed sighting. And just like 
the earlier case with the men in black that I mentioned in the apartment in Brooklyn, Robinson, Derringer's place was completely torn apart on several occasions and he was missing his writings, his letters, things that he was writing about regarding his experience. So these last few examples were all right in Point Pleasant or right around it and connected directly to Point Pleasant to the Mothman, to the UFO sightings, to everything. Yeah, say what you want about the Men in Black as a whole. Just the fact that these people were visited by somebody, by these government, quote-unquote, possible officials, whatever they are. Mary Heyer saw them, John Keel saw them, Derringer was visited by them. Um, Linda Scarberry was visited by them. So all directly tied to the Mothman. And it's our job to figure out why. Alright guys, the next episode we're going to be talking all about John Keel, his book The Mothman Prophecies, all the research he was doing in Point Pleasant when he arrived to town, and... Let's see if we can shed some more light, dive deeper, and figure out exactly what the Mothman of Point Pleasant truly is. Take care, guys.